and let's go ahead and share this. Let's go ahead and sh we'll share the PowerPoint application this time. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, that's a little better. We'll, sh we'll share the screen here. Okay, all right. We'll try sharing the screen today. All right, let's get started. Uh, let me make this bigger. Okay, so um, the attended, so first off, let, let's, let's uh, handle some logistics uh, and let's handle the grade components one at a time. So attendance. Attendance is up to date. Um, what I did for lecture 12 and for lecture 15 is I just counted everybody present because the uh, lecture 12 was the one that was in between the weather that we had and lecture 15 was the exam review right before we came uh, or right after we came back from from all the, the crazy weather that we had and I didn't think it was right to try and start holding people's feet to the fire on absences on that Monday. Uh, or the day before with, with all the weather. So I said, you know what, let's just um, uh, let's just uh, uh, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Homework. All the homework uh, uh, to date has been graded and no homework this weekend. Um, what, what I'm doing is because of the um, uh, because of the the, uh, the weather, I've had to change the way that I'm doing some of the um, uh, some of the connection related stuff and I said, you know what? Let's uh, let's go ahead and just um, not do homework today because what I'm going to do today is cover a lot of the groundwork that's necessary to get us rocking and rolling on connections because um, ultimately what I had to do is because we lost three lectures, I decided, okay, I've, I've got to cut some material and ultimately the way that I cover connections, I decided that it would be best to cut material from connections. So I've cut out threaded rod design, which uh, was kind of painful. I really wanted to cover that, but it's... It's ultimately, after you've done connections, I think you'd understand how it's a pretty straightforward uh, 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 process and it's, it's not that hard. Um, and then I'm cutting out a combined loading for connections and I'm cutting out balanced welds. Uh, and all of that is, if you understand the basics of connections, you can sort of work through a lot of that on your own. So I thought that was a fair way of going about it. So let's talk about the, um, uh, the schedule moving forward. So the schedule moving forward is um, I have... Uh, today we're going to talk about bearing type connections, and so that's going to be sort of our introduction to connections. Oh, hit the button. Uh, our introduction to connections, uh, and then uh, we're going to sort of really hit the ground running next week. Today I, is, is really more of a behavior discussion. We are going to do a little bit of math, but it's really more about um, just understanding the, the behavior of how a bolted connection works. Um, and I wanna focus on two limit states today, which is bolt shear and bolt bearing. And that'll become uh, evident as we get into the uh, discussion today. What we're gonna do Monday is we're gonna sort of round up our discussion of how to analyze a bolted connection, which is uh, talking about connection layout requirements. And then we're gonna get into bolted connection analysis and bolted connection design. I, I basically, we're going to do all of bolts next week, uh, except for one topic that's going to linger a little bit at the end, and that's a slip critical connection. Uh, and you'll kind of understand what a slip critical connection is today, uh, or after lecture today. The final three lectures before our exam is going to be about welding. Uh, and the fundamentals of connection design are, are, are really straightforward that has 200 kips and you know each bolt can hold up 15 kips. Take 200 divided by 15 and boom, that's how many bolts you use. And same thing with welds. If you know your connection has 300 kips on it and you know an inch of weld can withstand six kips, 300 divided by six tells you how many inches of weld you need. It's it's that simple. There's a lot, you know, a lot more to talk about when it comes to, you know, the details and and how you space bolts out and what you can do with, with uh, welds, you know, minimum and maximum weld sizes and all that. But by and large, that's that's it. So um, I, you know, I thought this was sort of the, the the best place to cut. The exam is hasn't moved, so we're going to do the second exam on the same day. So the exam is just going to have less on it. And you may not believe me after the first exam, but uh, traditionally everybody who's taken this class has said the second exam is the easiest. So uh, I think it's even going to be easier because there's just that much less stuff on it. 
after um, after the, uh, these cuts. So that's what we're going to do, uh, and I want to jump right into bolted connections. Before I do, though, is there anybody here? I'll go back a slide. Anybody uh, have any questions about the logistics? Let me grab my steel manual. Oh, here it is. Okay. All right, then let's talk about bolted connections. And I want to talk a little bit about bolts themselves. I want to talk about um, uh, uh, the different limit states that affect it. Uh, we're going to talk about layout requirements probably on Monday. Uh, and layout requirements are basically just how, like, how you actually lay out a connection, how far apart the bolts are spaced from each other, how far, par how far can they be from the edge of the plate, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and we're going to talk about that on Monday. Today, I just want to focus on the strength characteristics of a bolted connection. Um, so let's talk about bolts themselves. Um, by and large, there are two bolts uh, that are used, or two grades of bolts that are used most commonly uh, in, in structural applications. Uh, the first is an A325. That is the most common uh, grade of structural bolt that we use in, in structural engineering applications. It's most common in building construction. It's used quite a bit uh, in bridges as well. The other very, very common bolt uh, is an A490. The difference between an A325 and an A490 is that uh, A490 bolts are a little bit more expensive, but they're also stronger. So the idea is that you pay more per bolt, but you don't have to use as many of them. Okay. Now, of these two, uh, you know, um, if I said you know buildings and bridges, uh, A490, you're probably going to find more common in a bridge application than a building application because uh, bridges they just tend to experience much heavier load demands. Um, and, and also uh, with bridge uh, connections, uh, the, you know, and with the, uh, the idea of using a slip critical connection, A490 bolts tend to be uh, pretty commonly applied in bridges uh, versus buildings. Now there is, uh, there are other grades of bolts such as like A307s, but they're very uncommon. Uh, we really only use them for secondary members. They're not common in structural applications. The only reason I throw them on the slide is because they are, they, they do get referenced in uh, some uh, sections in the manual and I didn't want to, to leave you hanging. Like what's the deal with this A307? They're, they're secondary bolts that, that really aren't uh, used very often. Um, Whenever you see a structural bolt, and I do kind of want to um, show you this, whenever you see a structural bolt, you'll tend to see two symbols on the uh, on the head of the bolt. The first one is the uh, A325, that's the grade. That's, and so when I say A325 or A490, what I'm talking about is the ASTM specification that that bolt has to meet. And so uh, if you've had uh, Dr. Knopf or CE321, you know all about ASTM because you use ASTM standards in testing cylinders and doing sieve analyses and all that stuff. Well, ASTM writes oodles and oodles of specifications. You know, when we mention A36 steel or A572 grade 50 steel, those are all ASTM you know, spec uh, 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 specifications. And so this is the ASTM spec that that, um, that, that uh, uh, bolt meets. Uh, and then uh, the little letter N that you see on the bottom, that's the manufacturer designation. So there's different symbols for different manufacturers. This bolt was manufactured by Nucor, you know, N-U-C-O-R. So their symbol is a little N. So uh, whenever you see a structural bolt, there's usually always two symbols on it, one for the ASTM spec and one for the manufacturer. Now, um, one thing I do want to mention uh, so that you're aware when you're navigating the manual is that you're going to see something else in the manual besides uh, A325. You're probably going to see more reference to these terms right here, uh, group A and group B. Okay, And so let me explain what, what's going on there. Okay, A325 and A490 are the most common uh, uh, bolt application or bolt uh, assemblies that we use in structural engineering, period. But there are other ways of affixing uh, a bolt to a, 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 a structural system. So for instance, if I look at the image on the previous slide, uh, th you know, what we're talking about here, you know, this would be a very traditional uh, uh, bolt system. There's a bolt, you know, washer, nut, take a wrench on one side, wrench on the other, tighten, right? That's a bolt, okay? There are other ways to affix bolts to a, uh, to a given uh, 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 structural system. One way is to use what's called twist-off control bolts. 
Okay, now this is a really nifty system if you've ever seen it, but this is what a twist off control bolt looks like. And so if you notice, um, you really can't get a wrench around the top of the bolt because it's rounded, right? So how do you tighten this bolt, you know, uh, in an application? Well, the, the answer is you, you use one of these things on the right. This is a very special wrench that is utilized just for twist off control bolts. And the idea is that you can tighten the entire bolt assembly while only having a wrench on one side. See, this wrench, what it does is it actually grabs the assembly in two places. It grabs the nut, and then it grabs this little uh, uh, nubbin here on, on the outside. I know somebody liked that word uh, that I mentioned earlier. But this little nubbin here on the outside, you can see it's got these little grooves on it. And so what the, what the wrench does is it, is it actually spins the, the nut and the bolt in opposite directions so you can tighten the whole thing from one side. Now, here's the thing. This bolt has all of the same structural properties uh, as this one, but it falls under a different ASTM designation. So what the manual does is they group all of the bolts that have similar material properties into these clusters in the manual, and they call them Group A and Group B. So I, I want to be clear, there is no such thing as a Group A bolt or a Group B bolt. Um, instead, what they're doing is they're clumps they're clustering all of the bolts and all the the bolt products that have similar material properties all into these various categories so if you ever hear me mention an a325 bolt for instance a325 is group a a490 is group b sometimes i might say a325 and you have to recognize that that's group a sometimes i might say just what's the capacity of a group a bolt uh, and, and you can just look it up. I just want you to understand when you see here in a bit what's the deal with Group A and Group B, that, that's what's going on. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? What would be the purpose of using this special bolt assembly uh, aside from ease of assembly? Ease of assembly? Um, that's, that's basically it. They, they're very fast. Um, the other thing, and this is going to become a lot more uh, important later when we talk about slip critical connections, there are two uh, classes of bolted connections that we, uh, that we implement in structural engineering. One is a bearing type connection and one is a slip critical connection. In slip critical connections, you are uh, relying on the friction that develops between the two plates being sandwiched together as a load resistant mechanism. But in order to do that, you have to ensure that those bolts meet a certain pretension. And the nice thing about twist off control bolts is that they, they meet that tension. Whenever a twist off control bolt has been pretensioned to the specified value, that little nub, oh, drop my pen. That little nubbin actually chucks off. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that later when we look at, uh, at, when we look at slip critical connections. So as an inspector, all you have to do is look at all the bolts and if the nubs are chucked off, then you know they're pretension. Uh, so that's another reason uh, uh, for using them is, is, is on that side uh, as well. So they might be a little bit more expensive, but they're also fast. Uh, would they be used for, for Acro bridges? Uh, I, uh, no. Um, well, I guess they could. Uh, I see them used quite commonly in splices in bridges because a, a splice connection has a lot of bolts. And so you can, you know, go through and just doom, 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 do them all uh, at once. Um but I, I guess you could use them for acro. I, I just, I don't think they do. I know, I know what bridges you're talking about, the prefab trusses. But yeah, splices and bridges, I've seen them use quite a bit there because they're fast. Any other questions? This is good stuff. Okay. So I want to talk about just the forces that get developed inside a, a, a bolted assembly. And then that leads to the three different limit states that we end up assessing. The three limit states that, that we end up dealing with in a, in a bolt assembly are bolt shear, bolt bearing, and then slip resistance, which slip resistance only matters for a slip critical connection. And so we're only going to focus on the first two today. But here's kind of the idea of what's going on. Okay. So... The easiest way to, to think about this is to, you know, imagine, you know, if anybody here has a marker or a pen or something in their hand, imagine grabbing the pen, you know, grabbing it with your two fists, you know, one in one hand, one on the other, 
imagine grabbing it and and you know trying to rip it in sheer almost like you were trying to rip a, a sheet of paper okay so what you're doing is you're taking you know your hand right and one hand might be moving up and the other hand might be moving down just like kind of what's going on in this connection like one plate is pulling to the left and one plate uh, is pulling to the right so what does that do well uh, what does that do to this bolt assembly well the first thing it does is you actually are uh, taking the bolt and subjecting it to shear, right? So the one of the first things that could happen is you could actually snap the bolt in half, right? And that, or not really snapping, you know, I, I use that term loosely, really what I'm talking about is shearing the bolt in half. Almost like imagining those two plates acting like a big old pair of scissors cutting the, the bolt in half, right? So that would be bolt shear, actually shearing the bolt uh, in half. Now the other thing that's happening, think about uh, when you know when you have your hand and you're trying to you know rip the marker in half. Well, not only could the marker fail, but your hands could fail too. Maybe your hands aren't strong enough to fail the marker, and you just you know your your hands give out. And so the analogy here is maybe it's not the uh, bolt that fails, but maybe it's the plate that fails. Okay. So what I mean by that is. If you look at you know this uh, this given connection, you know if you're yanking on this plate this way, well the bolt is going to come into contact with the plate right here, and so the bolt's going to be mashing up on the plate. Likewise, on this one down here, the bolt's going to be mashing up into the plate right there. Okay, and so maybe it's not the bolt that fails maybe it's the plate that fails and the plate can fail in, in one of two ways we'll talk about the specifics of that later uh, but that's what we call a bolt bearing failure it can either fail in bearing or it can fail in, in tear out and we'll we'll again we'll, we'll talk about the specifics of that in a bit uh, finally what can happen is you can lose uh, you can uh, 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 fail the connection by slip resist or by, by a slip failure and that only happens when you're counting on the friction. Some connections you count on the friction, some uh, connections you don't. Um, what do I mean by the friction? Well, whenever I have plate A and plate B and I stick a bolt through them and I tighten the bolt, what happens to the two plates? Well, they sandwich together, right? And the harder I wrench on that bolt and get that bolt you know, tight, 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 the tighter I tighten that bolt, the more force is going to be developed between the two plates. I mean, just think about it. If I had two plates of steel bolted together and I really tighten that bolt, those plates are going to be sandwiched together. That's going to generate a normal force. And then if I yank on the force like that, remember how we take a normal force and we multiply it by a coefficient of friction to develop a resistant force in friction? Remember that from statics? So it's the same idea, right? That if we're if we develop a lot of normal force between the two plates, we can generate a friction between the two plates. And that friction can actually be used to resist the load. Now, in order to do that, you have to uh, ensure that the bolt meets a specific pretension. And that's where twist-off control bolts or some of the other uh, pretensioning methods that uh, we'll discuss later are, are going to come into play. Now, um, I, I guess one question... Uh, so. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, ultimately, what we do in, in structural engineering is we end up dealing with two classes of uh, bolted connections, either bearing type connections where the load is transferred by the bolts bearing onto the plate and actually coming into contact with the plate, or slip critical connections where we worry about the friction. When we deal with bearing type connections, we ensure that they have adequate capacity under bolt shear and bolt bearing, but with slip uh, critical connections, they have to meet all three, okay? Whenever you see, if, if, if I were to give you a load and give you a connection scenario and say, okay, design me a bearing type connection and then design me a slip critical connection and compare the two, typically what you'll find is that slip critical connections use a lot more bolts because you don't get as much uh, uh, friction uh, force per bolt that you get, say, shear capacity per bolt. Uh, a rule of thumb is that slip critical connections tend to use about twice as many bolts as bearing type connections. So why would you use uh, slip critical connections? Well, uh, typically a slip critical connection is utilized whenever you are worried about the connection, you know, remaining stable either under very heavy loads or repetitive loading. 
So two common applications for slip, uh, slip critical connections are bridges, all right? Imagine, the, 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 the analogy I, I imagine is, uh, imagine you had a bolt on a lawnmower and the bolt wasn't really tight. You start the lawnmower and the lawnmower's going like this, you can imagine that bolt kind of getting loose. Now, that isn't, you know, you're not experiencing that level of excitation on a bridge, you know, like you would a lawnmower, but we're designing bridge connections to last for 75 years. So having them be uh, uh, slip critical kind of makes sense given the, the scenario. The, the other instance uh, where slip critical connections tend to be utilized is in earthquakes uh, or in earthquake prone regions because of the, the high uh, force demand. Uh, and, and again, if you fail it, it, the connection in slip, it still has that bolt shear and bolt bearing capacity uh, to rely upon. So that, that's sort of where, that, uh, where that shakes out. Any questions? Could you amplify this tension with the sandwich material that has? That's a good question. Um, uh, so you're, you're asking about basically changing your mu value, changing your coefficient of friction. So th that's a really good question, uh, and it's a, it, it's a topic of you know research. Now, a um, like we tend to not really use like rubberized materials, but one of the things that we can do is change the surface condition. So, for instance, uncoated steel versus like steel that's been blast cleaned, you know, the sandblasted and whatnot, can have different uh, uh, frictional properties, um, and so that is something you can impact. Uh, but I mean, the the uh, the the um, what you're talking about isn't really done. Now, let me say this: we do use vulcanized we do use vulcanized rubbers in in certain uh, uh, aspects and certain locations in uh, in structural engineering, particularly when we are trying to get a little bit of movement. So, elastomeric bearings on the ends of bridges is a common instance where we would use uh, you know like a vulcanized rubber type material, um, and that's like thermal expansion and contraction and uh, and and uh, 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 just general you know translation of the bridge uh, but we don't really do that a lot in bolted connections but we do have ways to change the mu value that's a that's a good question you are so uh, mr. Riggs talking about like basically changing the geometry like making the geometry jagged you're talking about like a, a phenomenally uh, expensive fabrication process that might be solved more easily by just adding more bolts you know because you're going to get a capacity on a per bolt basis so why don't I just use regular old steel and more bolts it's it's not a bad idea you know to try and you know think outside the box and thinking in terms of uh, changing the 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 overall surface uh, conditions but there's probably other ways we can go about it now Nowadays with CNC and even, you know, I mean, you could even 3D print metals nowadays. Who knows, you know, what happens in the, in the future. Yeah, as, and Mr. Blizzard basically said, you know, you know what I was saying. Okay, so let's talk about the specifics of bearing type connections. So bearing type connections can fail in two fashions. Either the bolt's going to fail, like it's going to fail in shear, or the plate's going to fail. And when I say plate, it could be, you know, just a plate. It could be a, a web and a C shape. It could be a flange and a W shape. I'm just, I'm using the plate term generically, just a, you know, plate of steel. And so for each of those, there's going to be a VRN that we can compute. A VRN for bolt shear and a VRN for uh, a bolt bearing. And we just take the, the, whichever one governs, which is the minimum. Now for bolt shear, we're going to have a very, very handy design aid that we can use. It's going to make our lives really nice. Uh, but I want to talk about the underlying theory of that uh, that aid before we dig into it. Now, later on, we're also going to have connection layout requirements to meet, but we'll we'll get to that uh, in a bit. So let's take each of these one at a time. Let's start with bolt shear, and let's see what we can uh, what we can discern with with a bolt shear limit state. So with bolt shear, um, so one of the things you're going to find is that when it comes to the specifications, we're going to be living in Chapter J for a while. So I'm going to turn to Chapter J, and I'm specifically on page 16.1-131. Uh, um, and so it's, uh, I don't know if you can see here, uh, I'll switch my, um, switch my webcam here. So it oops, it's on 16.1-131, and it's on the bottom of the page right there, the bottom right. 
Um, I don't know if you all can see that in the in the camera, but uh, this is on the bottom, and we're on uh, we're in section J three. J two is the section on welds. J three is the section on bolts. J one is just the introductory material. Covers all the ASTM specs and whatnot. Um, and if you go to J3.6, this list is this lists not only the tensile strength, but the shear strength of bolts and anything that's threaded. And so all you're doing it to determine the nominal resistance, and this is just bolt shear, is just taking the area of the bolt. And so the area of the bolt's gonna be, you know, like pi over four times D squared, you know, just you know, area of a circle times the nominal resistance. So whether or not it's, you know, FNT for uh, tensile stress or FNV from shear stress. And if you notice, um, it tells you where you're going to find that value. It says um, uh, it's in table J3.2. Okay. Now, um, uh, there are two questions that we're going to have to answer that are really important. But the nice thing about bolts is like once you can answer this question, there are no curveballs. This is it. Uh, and that is whether or not threads are included in the shear plane and how many shear planes are present. If you can answer those two questions, you've got bolt shear figured out and you've got it figured out completely. There's, there's nothing else to discern. Okay. So let me see if I can take each of those items one by one and let's see if we can break it down. Okay. Let's start off with threads in the shear plane. So imagine that I've got two plates that are connected and I've got a bolt going through them. Okay, can anybody see the difference between the two images? Can you kind of see what the problem is? If you go to, you know, uh, the shear plane, and maybe I'll rigorously define it here for you, you know, it's here on the slide, but the shear plane is that plane that passes through the bolt between the two plates. So, you know, if I look at the image on the right, I'm cutting through the bolt right there. Whereas the image on, or sorry, the image on the left, the image on the right, I'm cutting through the bolt right there. See the difference? On the left, I'm cutting through the threads. And on the right, I'm cutting through the shank of the bolt. So, uh, so I, I'm not, uh, the, the threads are excluded. Which one do you think is weaker when the threads are included or the threads are excluded? There you go. Exactly right. Uh, so whenever the threads are included, that's that's the weaker uh, 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 situation because the the bolt the area is smaller. You're cutting through a smaller section. Okay. Now structural engineers are are, are not very creative, so we adopt a naming convention. So if you ever see me say something like A three twenty five N or A four ninety X, the N indicates whether or not the threads are included and the X indicates whether or not the threads are excluded. Now, here's another question for you. Uh, the, 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 the situation, the, the, the condition as to whether or not the threads are included or included are included or excluded are a function of the geometry. Like you got to know the bolt that you're using. You got to know the thickness of the plates. But let's say you're in design land and you don't know because you haven't picked bolts. If you don't know, which one would you assume? Threads included or threads excluded? Included, included, exactly right. If you don't know, assume the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is threads included, right? And you're going to see the math of, as to how that shakes out here in a bit. So yeah, always assume the threads are included unless you know otherwise. If you know they're excluded, don't don't do that. But but yeah. So so does that make sense, Mr. Ball? Okay. Now, if everybody's got their manual open, I want you to turn back a page. I want you to turn to 16.1-129, and there is a table that occupies the entirety of that page. Uh, and it is uh, the table that lists the FNT and FNV values for, uh, for bolts. So uh, this is what it looks like on 16.1-129. It you know, takes up the whole page. All right. Now, 
if you look, I, I'm really focusing on the top four rows. So there's A307, and we're going to ignore that. That's kind of why I mentioned A307, so that you saw that it's a secondary bolt. We never really use it, but I didn't want you to go, well, what, what's that? So, okay. Now, let's look at the group A bolt. So if you notice, there's two rows. There's a group A when threads are not excluded, and group A when threads are excluded. So the top row is for threads included. The bottom row is for threads excluded. And look at the values. Okay, the left values are for tensile strength. And they don't change, right? Because if I'm yanking on the bolt as opposed to shearing it, so if I'm pulling on the bolt in tension, it doesn't matter whether or not threads are included or excluded from the shear plane because I'm not shearing it. I'm applying tension. But if the threads are included versus excluded, that does affect the shear stress, the FNV value. So the FNV for group A bolts is 54 KSI if the threads are included, and it's 68 KSI if the threads are included. So the bolt is weaker if threads are present. So that's where that, where that comes from. So my advice, keep this page open because we're gonna use it here in a second. Okay, does this make sense? Everybody okay with this? Wrong, wrong, wrong window. Okay, so let's go to the other situation that affects a bolted connection, and that's the loading condition. So the loading condition would be whether would would basically be trying to figure out how many planes there are. It's possible that you know you might have what's called a lap connection. This is this is what we would call a lap connection and this might be something like a splice connection down here and the difference between the two is that we're only passing through you know one plane through the bolt here whereas uh, down here we're actually having to fail it through two separate planes in order to fully fail the bolt so in this situation down here the VRN is twice the, 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 the capacity of a bolt in single shear. It's not that the bolt got magically twice as strong, it's that you're having to rip through twice as much material. So in, the, in this situation down here, you know, it, for instance, if this VRN is, I don't know, like 25 kips, then this VRN is 50 kips, if nothing else changed. Does that make sense? What and, and what we would do in terms of terminology is we refer to this bolt as single shear and we refer to this bolt as double shear. So that, that's all it means. And some I've had students ask, well, what about triple shear? Uh, I have actually seen a triple shear uh, connection in real life, but it's only been once. And there was a, it was actually a truss bridge in Ripley, West Virginia, where they had the truss and then they had the floor beams framing into the joint. So you had like the beam, you had the plate, and then you had another plate, and then you had the truss member. And so there were bolts in triple shear, but that was incredibly rare. Uh, more often than not, it's just single shear or double shear. Everybody with me so far? All right. Let's do a thought, ex or a thought experiment, okay? What is the design resistance of a three quarter inch diameter uh, A325 bolt in single shear, assuming the threads are excluded? Okay, so let's just work this out. So phi is 0 0.75 for, for bolt shear, okay? Um, the bolt diameter is 3 quarters of an inch, so therefore the area of the bolt uh, is pi over 4 dB squared. So that's just the area of a circle, so pi over 4 three quarters of an inch squared, which is, what is that? Point, I think it's like 0 0.601 or something. Oh, 0 0.442 inches squared. Am I getting, is anybody else getting that? I want to make sure I'm not off here. Y'all are quiet. Uh, 
Okay, all right. I was getting worried. Okay, now what we need to do is look up an FNV value. Now, hopefully you've got that table open, table J3.2. This is table J3.2, J3.2 on page 16.1-129. Now, help me out. What group are we going to be? Is this group A or group B? Let's see if y'all been paying attention. Group A. And so for group A, threads excluded, FNV equals what? Sixty eight KSI. There we go. So therefore, VRN is 0 0.75 68 KSI times 0 0.442 inches squared and what does that come out to be? 22, we'll, we'll call it 22.5. We'll just keep it simple. Kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. Now, here's the thing. So, I've got a three-quarter inch diameter bolt, single shear, threads excluded. The capacity is 22 and a half kips. All right. So, that's not too bad. That's simple, right? If you understand that, check this out. Okay. So this is what I, I want everybody to turn to this right now. Okay, so first off, this is new. Okay, so you haven't seen this before. So I want to show you something over here on my little camera here. I don't know if you can pull up my webcam. So what I want you to do is I want you to focus on those little black and silver tabs that are, that are in the manual. And I want you to find the one that says bolts. Okay, and when you see bolts, you should see part seven that says design considerations for bolts. And I want you to turn to page 22 within that section. So it'll be page 7-22. And what you should see is this table on the uh, on the screen. So it should look like this. Just say table 7-1, available shear strength for bolts. Okay. This table is awesome. This is one of the most useful tables in the whole manual. Okay. Because this will, and it's a simple table too. This will tell you the available shear strength per bolt basically with any condition, whether it's group A or group B, whether or not it's uh, threads ex included, threads excluded, what the single shear versus double shear, the diameter. So check this out. So we were in, so let's take the problem we just did. Okay. So the problem we just did, you said it was group A, the threads were excluded. It was in single shear, three quarter inches in diameter. Boom. 22 and a half kips. So I wanted that's the that's the point as as Mr. Blizzard said I wanted you to understand the whole point of that problem that we just did is I wanted you to respect this table because this table just does that for every potential iteration whether or not your your bolt diameter changes whether or not your thread condition changes your your shear condition changes all that it it accounts for it all okay it, and it has everything that you would need. Now, keep in mind, we are using the blue numbers, not the green numbers. I think this is the first time that, that that's actually been a point that we need to emphasize. The blue numbers correspond to LRFD, and that's what we're using. So never use the green numbers for anything that, that we do in here. Does, is everybody able to find that table? Does anybody have any questions? I'll give everybody a sec. I want to make sure you can find that. This is definitely one to put a bookmark in because we'll use this one pretty regularly. <laughs> 
And notice one of the, the other things to notice, uh, and this is something maybe I didn't, uh, you know, fully, you know, elucidate. It, it, you know, for instance, um, the difference between all the single shear and the double shear is just that it's double. So, like, if you take twenty-two and a half right here and double it, what is twenty-two and a half times two? It's forty-five. So, you know, that's where this is coming in. The difference between the what, why is it forty-five point one? It's just rounding, you know, because you've got pi in there, so the numbers aren't. You know, they're not perfect, you know, uh, uh, rounds. But like most of the time, it is like this is seventeen point nine. That's thirty five point eight. That's you know pretty even. So they're going to be double just with you know maybe rounding in there. Does that make sense? So you don't need. So to be clear, in homework exams, you don't need to do this because this table does it for you. I just wanted you to go through that exercise so that you understood what this table is. Okay, I'm assuming everybody's good, so I want to move on to bolt bearing. Uh, I put an example here at the end of this uh, PowerPoint. We will probably not get to it today, and that's fine because what, what is incredibly important is that we talk about bolt bearing, and so I'd rather make sure that you understand that. Okay, so what's... Whoa, I don't know what happened there. My, my remote got all crazy on me. Pulled a, it pulled a, a, a Barry Allen. I don't know what happened there. All right. Okay. So let's talk about the way that the plate can fail as opposed to the way that the, uh, the bolt can fail. So really what can happen to the plate is it can fail in two fashions. And I love this picture because you can see both plate failures on the same connection. It's so cool. So um, the first is what's called bolt tear out. So bolt tear out, what happens is, so you have a, um, you have a plate, right? And you've got, you know, some load on it and you have, let's say a bolt right here. And what happens is you actually start to, you know, create like a little tear right here and you tear it out and you're actually just, it's like a fracture, like a sheer fracture that fractures through the plate. And to be honest, it's very similar to um, uh, to, to to block shear. Um, very similar to block shear. Hold on, what happened? Oh, okay, there we go. My uh, my screen just sort of went blank there. Am I still live? Okay, good. Okay, I don't know what happened. It just it, for some reason my 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 monitor that pulled up my blackboard just went blank. Sorry about that. Okay. So bolt tear out is really like a very mini block shear check, whereas bolt hole ovalization, and, and I'll be honest, sometimes the manual just calls this bolt bearing. I don't like that. I wish it would um, explicitly state that one's tear out and one's ovalization. But basically, you know, one of them is about um, a tear out and the other is about the plastification around the bolt. So here's your plate, you're yanking on it, there's your bolt hole. And what happens is, you know, the bolt's coming into contact with the plate and instead of tearing it out, it sort of like mashes it up and it yields and it plastifies and sort of turns like the metal equivalent of Play-Doh right there around the, uh, the end of the bolt. And so the whole, uh, the geometry of the hole changes and it just sort of mashes up there near the end. And so one of the two can happen and you kind of have to figure out which one and you end up just taking the minimum of those two. So um, the other thing that I should mention is that the tear out equation we can kind of derive. The hole ovalization is very empirical. We just use an expression and just sort of go with it because the mechanics of that are pretty complicated. So if you go to the manual, uh, this is on page 16.1-131. Uh, you don't need to turn to that, but you can if you'd like. So the fee value is 0.75, and by and large, any of the bolt shear and bolt bearing uh, fee values are all going to be 0.75. The only time that we're going to have a different fee value is associated with slip, because uh, the fee value is, it, it is different. Um, but if you go to section J310, uh, which is about bearing strength, um, so there's actually a lot of equations listed there. There's quite a few. Uh, and so, I, you know, if you turn the page, you'll kind of see there's like a whole bunch of them there. Um, here, I'll, I'll pull it up here on the uh, camera so you can kind of see. And, I, and what I've done here on the slide here is to try and uh, 
make the navigation a little easier. So this is what it looks like in the manual and you can see there's like oodles of expressions there. It starts on the top of the next page and it just goes on. Um, if you look at the, the, uh, the previous page, so there's case A, case B. So case A says for a bolted connection with a standard hole, you know, independent of the direction of loading. Uh, and then we have the bolt bearing expression and the bolt tear out expression. Um, the reason why I'm using the upper ones is because we are going to consider deformation at the service load a design consideration. There is an instance where you can consider it a design consideration. There's an instance when you can't or when you don't. So it's whether or not you as the engineer care about whether or not deformation of, at the service load is a design consideration. Some engineers say, I'll let it deform. That's no big deal. We're going to consider it a design consideration in here. And to be honest, most engineers do. I, I, I don't know that I've really met that many that, that don't consider a design consideration. So like the block shear check, um, what you can do is you can um, take that expression and rewrite it a bit and it looks like this. So it's the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU or 2.4 DTFU. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of terms here and there's of all these terms, there's only one of them that's complicated and it's the LC term and I've got uh, plenty of slides devoted to that here in a bit. But just to make sure everybody's clear on this, so T is the thickness, okay? And when I say the, the thickness, I, I call, I'm calling here plate thickness. The plate is whatever the bolt is going through. So if we're talking about, uh, let's say, bolts through the channel of a, of a or the web of a channel, uh, then the, the thickness is whatever the thickness of the web is. So like, for instance, if I have, let's say I've got this wide flange here and I've got bolts going through the... Uh, uh, the, the flange right here. Well, the thickness is whatever the thickness of this flange is or whatever the thickness of the web is. So that's what I mean by when I say plate thickness. I'm using the term plate, but I'm just saying whatever medium the bolt is going through. Um, the DB is the bolt diameter. Um, the F sub U, that's the tensile stress of the materials. So that's easy. And then our phi value is 0.75. Again, whenever you compute a nominal resistance, don't don't forget the, uh, the, the phi value. Um, the only thing that's new that you probably, you don't know what I'm talking about, is the LC value. So let's talk a little bit about LC. Okay, so what's the deal with LC? LC is called the clear distance, the clear uh, length. And it's specifically, so it's basically the clear distance of the plate between edges. And so it's either the distance between the edge of the hole and the edge of the plate or the edge, uh, the distance between the edges of two adjacent holes. And so what we do to clarify this a bit is we handle this on a per bolt basis. And specifically what we do is we look at edge bolts and we look at interior bolts. And you'll see what I mean by that here in a second. So what I'm gonna do is introduce some notation. So S is the longitudinal bolt, sp bolt spacing. We've seen S before, we use that for stagger factors. So S is just the center to center spacing of the bolts. But then I'm going to introduce this term, the edge distance. So the edge distance is from the center of the hole to the edge of the plate. Okay, so we'll call that LE. So for a connection like this, there would actually be two LCs. There'd be an LC for the edge bolts. And so again, I'm talking about from the edge of the hole to the edge of the plate. I'm talking about that distance. Or if I'm talking about bolts on the inside, it's edge of bolt, edge of bolt hole to edge of bolt hole, and it's that distance. Now, deriving those formulas is actually pretty easy. Like, for instance, if I was looking at, let's say, uh, this one, right, all I'm doing is I'm taking this distance right here. What's the dis difference between that and that? It's just half a hole diameter, right? So if I take this one, subtract half a hole diameter, boom, I've got LCE. So LCE is just the edge distance minus half a hole diameter. The interior distance is just the bolt spacing minus half a diameter here, half a diameter here, so minus a complete hole diameter, one diameter. So LCI is S minus the hole diameter. LCE is the edge distance minus half a hole diameter. Now before I open it up to questions, I got a little quirk though, and y'all aren't gonna like me on this one, but this is just the honest truth of it. Um, if you remember when we did tension members to get the hole diameter, we took the bolt diameter and we added an eighth of an inch. Okay, 
Now the reason we added an eighth of an inch is because we added a sixteenth for erection tolerance and a sixteenth for damaged material. So we actually physically drill the holder uh, the hole a sixteenth of an inch larger, but we add another sixteenth to basically say that that little lip of material is not effective in transferring load to the rest of the member. But that's not what we're doing here. Here we're looking at the actual hole. We're looking at the actual connection region. So when we do hole diameters here, we're not adding an eighth of an inch. We're adding a sixteenth of an inch because we're looking at the actual real physical dimensions of the hole. Okay, so that's that's what we're doing here. All right. Now, um, another thing that's, uh, that's worth mentioning is I'm mentioning edge bolts and interior bolts. What's the deal there? What's an edge bolt and what's an interior bolt? So the edge bolts are the ones that are on the outside of the member. So if you had a full-blown view of a member, these right here would be the edge bolts and these would be the interior bolts. So this member would have four edge bolts and then 16 interior bolts per connection. So since the connections are symmetric, we would only need to look at one. We don't look at both of them, okay? So since both of those regions are identical. But that's what I mean when I say uh, edge bolt versus interior bolt. Uh, and then sort of the last thing I want to mention before we actually call it for today, because I know I, uh, we're running short on time, is the bolt tear-out expression. Remember, I said this one is totally empirical. It's just, you know, fitting the test data, going down to the lab and ripping up connections and finding a, a, a match to the test data. But this one right here is actually comes from block shear because that 1.2 is actually a mini block shear check because what I'm doing is taking the area of the plate, again, assuming that the plate, you know, is in three dimensions, right? So this area right here is LC, LC times T, multiply it by FU, multiply that by 0 0.6, but then recognize that there's another one over here. So 2 times 0 0.6 is 1.2. So that's where that 1.2 comes from. It's not 1.2, it's 2 times 0 0.6 because there's two planes on either side. So that's actually kind of like, it's like a, I like to think of it as a mini block shear check. Okay, um, we're not going to have time to do our connection problem today, and that's fine. But I want to see if there's any questions, any conceptual questions before we move on or, or call it for the day. On Monday, we're going to do a problem and do it right. All right, well, I'm here and none. I know I threw a lot of info at you, but I'm not giving you a homework assignment. What I want you to do is let that steep, let, you know, let it soak in. And then on Monday, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit to that because I want to talk about layout requirements, how you actually lay out a connection. And then we're going to do a full-blown uh, problem start to finish. And then I think you'll be ready to start tackling some homework problems, getting into the the the, the nitty-gritty of it, if you will, and then we'll, we'll hit the ground running. Um, that's all I have, though, for everybody. I uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. I'll do my best to try and get the exam graded over the weekend, and we'll uh, you know, move on from there. And with that, everybody have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you on Monday. That's all I got, everybody. You too.